So, yes, uh, the final exam will involve questions about Python and Scheme and SQL. Uh, it's mostly uh, like maybe half midterm two material or maybe more because like in a normal semester, it'd be about half stuff up to midterm two and half stuff after, but we've made a bunch of the after stuff optional. So more of the exam will be just about, uh, and, and like lots of people didn't take midterm two. So I'd say like most of the exam will be about stuff that happened before midterm two. And then there will be some, you know, questions, make sure you learn some scheme, um, questions, make sure you learn some SQL. But um, yeah, but the topics that are now optional always had final exam questions associated with them, and those will get replaced with kind of pre midterm two material. Yeah, that's my plan is to just kind of be more thorough about covering midterm two material on the final because so many people didn't take midterm two. This is my only chance to tell whether people learn that stuff or not. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, what happens to homework assignments that have historically been about stuff that's now optional? Uh, I think we'll still have homework, but they'll be pretty short. And then we'll include some optional problems, which are the ones about the optional topics. So you don't have to do them if you don't want to. Um, and then like the, the other problems will be more sort of review oriented. Um, and yeah, those those homework assignments were overlapping with the scheme project, which was always kind of problematic. So okay. we'll, we'll try to make them as small as possible so that you kind of just focus on the project. Sure, it's not it's uh, optional, but we'll go over it anyway. Uh, and I think it's in Wednesday's lecture, not today's lecture. Until okay. well, I yeah, mean, I figured the gist, Sorry. right? The gist is that you know when you call a function you build an environment that has access to your local names and the global names mm -hmm. and it might have access to the enclosing scope if you define a function within a function right yeah it never has access to all the names from the caller okay yeah so like whatever names you have available, if you want to pass stuff into the function, you have to do it explicitly. You have to like say, oh, I want to pass in X and Y and Z in the call expression. Otherwise, that function's body can't refer to X and Y and Z. Mm, but okay. with dynamic scope, which is what Moo is all about, the name Moo we just made up for the course, but <laughs> dynamic scope uh -huh. is a real thing. Dynamic scope says when you call a function, the frame you create's parent was your frame that you were just in, which means that you have access to all the names that were available before you made the function call. Okay. So, uh, yeah, like there are these cases where you need to pass in like nine different arguments to a function because you're just like passing along all this state into a new function. But dynamic scoping lets you skip all that and just say like, oh, anything that you can refer to outside of the function call, you can also refer to into the body of the function. That's the story. So promises and streams exist in the scheme interpreter, but are optional content this semester. And therefore, even though they're in the spec, for like how the language works, if you want to use our interpreter, you don't have to build that part. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Um, and the same is true for Moo. Oh, good question. So what is, so I said that the, the scheme executable program that we distribute to you for a lab and homework and stuff, is just the solution to the home to the project four, and that's true. It's a Python program. Um, when the behavior of Scheme is the same as the behavior of Python, we just let Python do the work. So there's nothing in there that like knows how to add two integers together. It just uses Python to add the numbers together. So the 
and this is very common. Is that when you want to build an interpreter for one language in another language, you take advantage of what's in the base language, in this case, Python, in order to handle all the stuff that's the same as the language that you're trying to interpret, which is Scheme. And like adding two integers together isn't any different in Scheme than it is in Python. So um, all these primitives, these built-in procedures, are basically implemented in equivalent Python and then run by the Python interpreter. OK, I see. Yeah. Like you're basically, so you're, you're using Python to write Scheme. And so you're just using what Python already can do, right? Is what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly right. So for every built-in procedure and scheme, there's a Python function in the implementation of the interpreter that does the work, does the addition or the eval or whatever it is, or the printing, you know. There's like, there's a way to do it in Python and you just write down what that is and then you have a built-in procedure for scheme. Hmm, okay. And that's how most you said are, most languages are? Yeah, this is how you, um, there's really only two ways to uh, build an interpreter. One is to build hardware. Uh, and that is complicated enough that, it, uh, you know, there are very few languages that are interpreted that way. There are all these uh, machine languages, they're associated with particular chips. And they do exist, and they, um, you know, they're very simplistic because you got to build circuits to do them. And everything else is either translated—that's what's called compiling—into another language, or it's interpreted, which is what we're doing here, where basically you're just describing how to evaluate one language in another language. Okay. Okay, I see. And, and that's even how Python would be then. Yeah, exactly. So Python's interpreter that most people use is written in C, which is just a different programming language, but describes how the Python language works. Okay, got it. And, and then C would be then written in another language? Exactly. So C um, is typically implemented, part of it's implemented in an assembly language, which is like a very low level language that can be translated into machine code um and then parts of it are also written in c so as soon as you like have enough of a language built that you can start expressing other facts about that language in that language then you don't need to use the other language anymore okay okay and what's particularly interesting is that there's a faster version of python on the standard release and oh. um it's always like a version or two behind so people don't use it as much unless they want it to run faster. And that one, which is called PyPy, is a Python interpreter written in Python. Uh, but it also writes all these like optimizations to make it run faster, all written in Python. So um, so that that happens too. But it's you know, if you take a programming language course, you'll learn about how exactly all that works. Uh, it's a little bit more straightforward to think about. Oh, I already have an interpreter for language A, and I want one for language B, so I'll write the interpreter for language B in the language A, which is what we're doing here. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, I see. And then once we do it, like a, mo a lot of it, you've basically, you'll provide for us, and then we're just writing like some parts of it, right? But how hard would it be to write the whole thing? um so what does it take to write the whole thing i mean there's some parts of writing an interpreter that aren't particularly glamorous like uh figuring out which punctuation marks are allowed inside of an identifier like a symbol it's kind of uh, annoying so we provide all that kind of stuff and there's the general structure of the thing we have this eval function which uh, detects what type of expression is being evaluated and decides how to evaluate it. And we give you some of that, but you could write it yourself. I mean, you, I definitely would recommend reading through the starter code they would give you. Um, and yeah, in previous semesters, we've had a scheme challenge version where you just have to write the whole thing yourself and we don't give you any starter code. And very few people do it. And occasionally people try to do it and then they realize 
two days before the deadline that they didn't <laughs> like their structure and then they have to go do the other one instead so it's a little uh, it's a little dicey we decided not to do it this time just because people seem busy enough they don't need the challenge version um but you know it's not it's not beyond your capacity after taking this course to build the whole thing except that it is a fairly large program and so you know it's the kind of thing where if you if you started with one structure but it didn't quite work out then you might need to change a lot of stuff in order to get it back to where you wanted which is uh which can be a fair amount of work so um yeah so probably the best thing to do is just do the project but then make sure you read through all of the other code and try to understand what it does and then you'll have a pretty good idea of how to build an interpreter yourself if you wanted to one day yeah so the program that you're building takes some big string as input that you type and tries to show you the side effects and value of that input. Um, That can be kind of an involved process because if this is the string that comes in, first step, which is the, the parsing or reading step, determines the tree structure of this, which is that it's a list with the word let and then this thing and then this thing. And this is uh two lists and this is an x and a three and this is a you know like how you'd read it um is that it's a bunch of nested lists so that part's pretty straightforward you do that in the project is your first question just to like make sure you handle all the cases of quotation and stuff like that um but reading through scheme reader.py will tell you everything there is to know about taking a sequence of uh symbols and figuring out the nested list structure which is like a problem you have to solve but it's not the interesting one it's not the interpreting one that's just the reading part the interpreting part takes in this whole expression figures out what kind of expression it is and then has a python function that describes how to interpret a let expression and how do you interpret a let expression well you create a frame where you've evaluated the three and the plus one three and you bind those to x and y so x is bound to three and y is bound to four and then you evaluate this thing now what's interesting about that long sentence i said is that it involves evaluating the whole expression by evaluating a bunch of sub expressions And then there's some other parts like create a new frame where you've bound x and y and then you evaluate this so every time i say evaluate that's a recursive call to the scheme evaluator which is a python function that takes in a scheme expression and an environment and tells you its value not quite what it's going to do is it's going to look at this thing say it's a procedure call because it's not let or if or anything like that. So it's going to look up in a table of scheme symbols. What's the Python function that's equivalent to this? And there's a Python function that's equivalent to this, which is a little bit different than just the times that's built into Python because it can handle as many numbers as you want. Uh. So there's a Python function that basically says, take all the arguments and multiply them together in like a while loop so it's you know a few line function and so this the interpreter says here's a call expression here's the symbol for the procedure let's look up what the procedure is so it's called like a scheme multiply or something like that which is a python function that describes how to go through a list and multiply everything together maybe with a call to reduce and then um it evaluates all these realizes they're just numbers and then it multiplies them together. So you evaluate the operator to get the function that does the work in Python. You evaluate the operands in order to get the arguments. 
and then you apply that function which multiplies these together to the arguments and you're done if x so, is yeah. greater than two then i want to say it's big otherwise if x is greater than one then i want to say it's medium otherwise i want to say it's small something like that yeah yeah um would be the same as saying look there's really three cases there's the x is greater than two case which is big there's the x is greater than one case which is medium and then there's the small case yeah like if you have basically you have what more than one condition you should probably be using a cond otherwise you get this big nested chain of yep. bits nice okay okay but it's not like you need con it's just like a convenience well yeah you don't write if something then something else something instead you just write if something then something else something 